Good day, and welcome to this video in which we are going to take a look at Juno Cassandra's post-processing tools. This video is the first video of three videos, and in this video we are specifically going to look at the post-processing tools aimed at the analysis of the forecasted network condition. So prerequisites for this video is that we presume you have already installed .NET Core 8 and Juno Cassandra Desktop. If you haven't done so, there's a video that we've made on inst installing Juno Cassandra Desktop. Yeah, I'll put a link to that video in the description box below. And we also assume that you've already watched Tutorial 1 video series, which means that you've already been able to run a model and have some idea of the basic concepts of the workbench, setting up your project files, etc. Now, I just want to reiterate that in this tutorial series, we are using a default domain model which deals with the road networks. But the same principles apply to other infrastructure types like pipelines and so forth. So just bear that in mind. The, this is a specific domain model that we are using. And again, I'll put a link to the documentation for this domain model in the description box below. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that this is the first video of three planned videos dealing with post-processing with Juno Cassandra. And so the, in this video, we are specifically going to look at the condition forecast. Obviously, one of the great objectives of a infrastructure deterioration model is to forecast what the future condition of your infrastructure network will look like. And the condition, the predicted condition of that network is, of course, of great importance to understand and document and convey to others. The second element is that the analysis of the treatments and the spending that you are forecasting for the future in order to achieve a certain condition into the future. And the third post-processing tool that you can find in Juno Cassandra is a set of diagnostic tools. So I have split this so that we'll deal with these uh, three components separately in three different videos. And so in this video, we are specifically going to look at a condition forecast. So let's head over and open Juno Cassandra and we can start getting going with post-processing tools in Juno Cassandra. So here I am in my Windows Explorer and you can see I am in my Tutorial 1 folder and I've gone into my work folder Cassandra and you can see the workbench in there. All this has been explained in the first tutorial series. And you can download this entire tutorial data from our Juno Cassandra website. I'll just quickly show you where that is. So this is the Juno Cassandra documentation website. Again, you can find a link to this website in the description box below. And if you go to getting started and you go to tutorial data, you can download the data for this tutorial over here. Just once again, take, take note that this page may look different by the time you get to this video, but you should already have downloaded this if you have followed along with tutorial with the first tutorial. Okay, so just getting back to our work folder. We are here in our work folder and this is our workbench. And after you've run a model, you will find in this folder called outputs that you see there's a whole lot of files in there. And there will be a file in here for each model configuration and each model parameter. So if you've got 50 model parameters, let's say a parameter to predict rutting, roughness, your objective function and things like that, then since you have 50 parameters for each model run that you do for a specific configuration, you are going to have 50 output files. So this, the number of files in your outputs folder can grow very quickly. So just take note of that. Of course, if you run the same model configuration again, it's not going to create a different set of 50 files. It will overwrite the existing files. But if you have, say, four different model configurations to present four different budget scenarios, then you are going to end up with four times 50 files in this folder. I just want to make you aware that at the time when I make this video, we are considering to uh, refine this output mechanism a little bit to write your outputs into a small local database on your in your outputs folder. Um, and that will just depend on how we see the, the, the software performs with this high quantity of files. So just take note of that. If we do that, then still uh, you will be able to export these files from the database in any event. So just take note of it that 
you can open up these are all csv files so you can open them up and you'll see your data is packed in for different modeling epochs and it's quite easy if you want to build your own set of post-processing tools to draw graphs and so on to work with these files i'll just open one of them and look at them so I'll, i'm going to go down here to let's say um, for example the uh, rut so here I've got uh, my RUT parameter and you can see the file name consists of the model parameter which is called para RUT and then the configuration tag at the end. So you can see because I've run different configurations, I've run a configuration called BCA1 one underscore five to present a 1.5 million a year budget a 2 million a 2.5 a 3 and a 3.5 so you can see for each one of those configurations for this model parameter called PARA underscore RUT which is my RUT parameter I have got a different output file and if I open this output file then you can see you have got some ident element identification columns here and then you've got the condition in each of your different epochs so it's quite easy to understand this file you can uh, copy this re these results to excel and go and draw your own graphs etc but in this video i'm going to show you what tools juno cassandra have to to do this post processing now just one thing i want to highlight while i've got this file open you can see there are some columns in the beginning year for this output file now these columns apart from the element index which is always present these are the so-called element identifier columns that you can specify in your model configuration setup so you can specify which columns you want to be exported with your model parameter and so typically these would be the information so that you can identify where a specific section is and th in these identifier columns if you specify them in your model configuration, they will be exported to all your output files so you can easily cross a reference between different files. Okay, so that's the output file. I'm going to close this file here. And now I'm going to open uh, Juno Cassandra. So I've got Juno Cassandra open and I'm going to select my workbench file which sits here in my tutorial project. Cassandra will do some checks. Now, because the the uh, i've already run this model the output files are already sitting in the output folder so i can head over straight away even though i've just opened juno cassandra i don't have to rerun my model the files are still there from a previous time i had it open and i ran the model so you can go straight over to post processing of course if you want to make a change to your model or you have changed your model configuration then before you head to processing you have to go and rerun your model right so you just click on start model run and you run it be very careful if you start a model run and then you cancel it right then you you may end up with partially complete output file so it's a good idea from time to time to go over to the tools menu and to completely clear your outputs folder right so it will ask you so it's asking me do you want to delete 742 files in the folder and so if you don't want to do that because it will delete all your model configurations then don't do that right so just be aware of that that is a quite a handy tool to just quickly clear your outputs folder and then you can rerun all your configurations if you've made any changes to it um, so let's go go now to the post processing menu and we will look at the elements on this menu that deal specifically with the condition forecast over time. And I am not going to discuss each of these menu elements now. I'll rather just discuss the ones that we're dealing with in this video and then we'll handle the other ones in the videos that are going to follow. So the first thing I want to look at is at the parameter statistics. So parameter statistics allow you to analyze the statistics for a specific parameter over all of the elements in the network over time so in other words if i'm looking for example at something like rutting i can get the mean rut depth over all the elements in the network at each model epoch right so i'm going to go down here and the first thing i want to do is to select my model configuration i'm going to select this model configuration called benef bca benefit cost analysis model for a 2.5 million budget and here are all my model parameters so again these parameters 
if you don't know where they're coming from, uh, basically you, you have to go and watch the first video series. But they come out of our domain model and they are specific to the domain model that we are using for this tutorial. If you want to build your own model, we will make videos to show you how to build your own model so you can have your own model parameters in here. But for this video series, we are using the default Juno Cassandra road network model, which is quite a sophisticated and complete model. So I'm just, I'm just going to focus on the rut depth parameter. So I just select my parameter rut and I run this command and there are all my statistics over all the model epochs. And you can see it's quite a handful of statistics. There's my 90th percentile. There's my mean value, etc. Now, of course, you can't learn too much from looking at the analysis like this. You want to take this to a spreadsheet or to a tool such as R. So what you will want to do is to basically copy this to the clipboard and take it to Excel for reporting. Now, in this tutorial, um, in the tutorial zip file, I have, if I just go back here to my Cassandra zip, uh, my Cassandra work folder, then you will see in here there's a folder called postproc. And in this folder, I have put a spreadsheet called report charts, where I have just basically done uh, some preparation work to show you how you can report this data. You can, of course, create your own reporting format with the uh, title sizes, font sizes, and so on that you prefer. But I'm just going to open this uh, file. And, and just one other thing I want to point out. It's important that you don't put this, any, any reporting tools, etc., spreadsheets and things like that in your outputs folder. Because as you've seen, if you clear your output folder, it, if, if you use Juno Cassandra to clear your output folder, it clears everything, right? All the files. And so if you've spent a, a half a day working on a, on a spreadsheet and you put it in your outputs folder, it's going to be gone. So always put it in the post processing folder or anywhere else next to your Cassandra. You can put it in other folders next to your Cassandra work folder, but just make sure it doesn't sit in your output folder. So I'm going to open this spreadsheet and you can see I've already got some data in here. I've prepared this so it's quite easy for you. If you're following along, you should be able to also open this. And then if I go back to Juno Cassandra, I've got my, my parameter data here. Um, all I need to do is to say copy to clipboard and I go back to my spreadsheet and I go to this cell over here, the corner cell, and I paste it, but I keep the formatting intact, right? So that's all I do. And then what I've done from all of these statistics, I have just extracted these two ones that I've highlighted here. So you can see here, I've got the formula here referring to C12 and so forth. And the same for the 90th percentile. It's looking at C56, which is over here. And then I just take this date. I just take these two formulas and they just dragged all the way there. And similar, similarly, I've just copied my model epochs over there. And then this graph here just basically re references those cells in the spreadsheet. And if I just drag my graph over here, you can see here I can now track what will my 90th percentile rut and my mean rut look like over time. And you can, you can see that this benefit cost analysis model without any adjustment with this budget level has done quite a good job to keep the mean rut depth very consistent over time. The 90th percentile has increased for a while and then it decreased and it stayed very persistent. And I end up with something that's slightly lower than my starting value with the um, budget that I have assumed. Now, of course, these graphs are very dependent on how well your model is calibrated and how relevant your reset values are to what you're actually achieving in the field in the long run. So that's the task of the modeler to, to make it to discuss with the client and make sure that the model is properly calibrated and that the, the trends and, and um, reset values predicted by the model are congruent with what you have achieved in the past and what is actually evidenced from the historical data. I'm going to take that as a given that you've as a modeler or as a client that you've already done that. So, so this tool, this parameter statistics is one of the first tools that you would want to get. The second one is the breakdown of a parameter by value sum. 
So here I'm also going to go, I select the same configuration, benefit cost analysis for 2.5 million a year. And again, I'm going to go down and select my rut parameter. But now I'm going to bin my data. And I'm then going to sum the, 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 the values based on a specific uh, input parameter column. I'm going to use length. So I want to find the total length that falls in each bin. Now, if you want to do it by area, you can go into your, these are all input file columns. You can go, for example, and pick that column, and then you're going to sum it by area. So I'm just going to do it by length. And these bins are basically the, the bins that you want to bin the data in. Now, Cassandra will automatically assume that you take everything from minus infinity up to the first bin. So if I say I want to do rutting in 0 to 5, I don't have to put 0 and then a 5. So the bins are pipe delimited. Just take note of that. They are pipe delimited. It's a short shorthand code. And so instead of putting it like that, I can just start with 5, 10, 10, 15, 20. And again, I don't have to put a high number like 999 or something here. Cassandra will automatically take everything higher than 20 into the last bin. Now, if you so once you've defined the, the bins and you've defined the, the value that you that you want to sum over, you can run the command and you can see it gives you here for 2023 the total length. So it's a sum of the values in this column that fall in the less than five um, uh, millimeter category and so forth. Now, if you sum all of this, you can calculate the percentage that this quantity represents. So if you tick this box over here and run it, now you get your data in percentage. Another uh, shortcut that I just want to show you is that when you uh, run this command in Cassandra, this bin will be saved for you um, until you install a new version at least so that you can, you can, it's, it's easy to reuse. So if I come back into this tool, parameter breakdown by value sum, and I go and select again that parameter, then if I type in five and a pipe, you can see it will remember for you that bin. So you can just select it. And what I actually like to use is four. As you can see, there's four, eight, 12, 16. So those are the bins that I prefer to use for, for rut depth. And if I run that command and I do it for percentages, then I can copy this to clipboard and I go back to my spreadsheet that we've already got open and I'm going to go to breakdown length percent, right? And I just go to the corner cell here and again, I paste it, keeping the formatting intact, right? And you can see now my graph here is accurately reflecting what the network will look like over time in terms of different categories and so forth. So this is very useful if you've got different levels of servers and you want to track them over time and so on. And once again, you can see for this example, the benefit cost analysis model has done a very good job of keeping the network conditions stable over time for that uh, given budget. The other option that you have is to just count the number of elements instead of the length that fall in each of these categories. So to do that, I go to the post processing tool and I go to parameter breakdown by element count. So this could be a bit misleading because you're just assigning one count to each element, regardless of how long they are of, or of the area involved, etc. So the first tool I showed you here, the parameter breakdown by value sum is actually more sophisticated. But I'll just show you this in any event. I'm going to go down to parameter rut. Now it doesn't ask me for the, the, the column over which I want to do the sum. But I can still put in here my shorthand and select very quickly my bins. And I'll, I'm going to report this as a percentage of the total number of elements. So now this is the count percentage. And I can copy this to clipboard. So if I go to my spreadsheet, I can do the same thing, paste it in here. And you'll see it just changes a little bit for this example. Um, but of course, this is no longer the percentage of total network length. I'll have to change this title if I'm going to use that. So just, just be aware of that, that if you 
want to use the counts, you, you have to, to report it as such. Okay, so the next tool, post-processing tool for analyzing future network condition is the KPI forecast. The KPI forecast is very similar to parameter statistics. I've already mentioned this in one of the earlier videos, but with the KPI forecast, you, are, you can predefine a set of parameters and statistics that you want to group in a KPI set. And just to show you once again where we do this, if we go to our Cassandra work folder and we go to inputs, then in our project data definition file in here, we have our KPI sets here, and this is where we define the KPI sets. And of course, if we, if I go, for example, and I copy this sheet, then when I go to the KPI definition set, I will find every sheet that is prefixed with a, uh, the letters KPI underscore, they will be picked up automatically and shown for me here. Okay, so let me just demonstrate that. If I go to my project data file, sorry, I make a copy of this sheet and I'll call this KPI set 3. I'm not going to change anything there and I save this, quite important, and I go and I reload my workbench file. Then if I go to KPI forecast, now I've got three KPI sets in there, right? So I'm just going to reverse that so I don't mess up our example project data. I'm going to delete that sheet, save this file, I'll go back, reload my workbench. And now if I go to post-processing and I go to KPI forecast, I've once again got my two sets there. So this is very simple. You basically can click, click on the KPI forecast, get the statistics, and again, you can just export this data out to Excel and draw graphs to your heart content. You'll see this is a very a relatively simple KPI set. I've just got 90th percentiles for some important parameters. Um, the second set here is a bit more sophisticated. This one for rutting, I've got mean, median and 90th percentile and the same for all of the others. It's sort of a very concise grouping of statistics for a selected set of parameters. So this is a, a very powerful tool. And then finally, the uh, parameter forecast is a very useful tool to look at a, con at a relatively concise overview of how, how treatments have been forecasted over your, your network and also what the condition will look like. So I'm going to select again this configuration and again the RUT parameter and I'm going to just click on get forecast and you can see I'm tracking here for example for a specific element this is the starting RUT depth the next rut depth and the next rut depth. Then I put a, a chip seal. You can see the rut has remained largely the same and it continues to, to grow like that over time. If I go um, here, for example, to a place where I have done a, a, a different treatment, uh, I'll search for something with a relatively high rut depth. So here you can see I've got on this road, I've got a rehab as, uh, placed here. There's the rehab placed and you can see the rut depth was 11.3 millimeters before and then it was reduced and in the next year it was 4.2 millimeters. So you can see how the, the, the treatments reset your condition. You can also copy all of this data to clipboard and paste it in there. There are some diagnostic tools associated with the parameter forecast. At the moment this filter condition uh, is not working the way we want so that something will get fixed but you can reduce the size of, of the, the font size so that you can see more in, in one screen and you can change the number of decimals being displayed and so forth. In a future video, we will look at this button that, that allows you to go to a selected element and then show the forecast and the raw data for that element. So this is a very powerful tool, but mainly used for debugging purposes. And we are going to have a specific video on diagnostics of your model uh, in this. That will be the third video in this series. So I think that's enough for today, for this video, just to discuss the post-processing tools dealing with the analysis of future forecast condition. In the next video, we'll look at the tools to summarize future treatment quantities and spending over the network. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.